Good morning and a warm welcome in Jesus' name. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's worship God together. Let's pray first. Lord God, on this beautiful morning, we rejoice in your goodness and your love to us, that you have created a wonderful world for us to enjoy. But we thank you as well that this first day of the week marks for us the resurrection of Jesus Christ, our Saviour and your Son. May what we do in his name be for your praise and glory and for our blessing. Amen. Let's sing God's praise together in Psalm 148 in the older version and the second version there. The Lord of heaven confess on high his glory rates. Him let all angels bless, him all his armies praise. Him glorify sun, moon and stars, ye higher spheres and cloudy sky. The whole psalm to God's praise. Now let's pray together. We'll pray the Lord's Prayer together first, and then I'll continue after that. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Lord, we rejoice that you are the creator of heaven and earth who's made such a wonderful world in which we may live. And this whole world praises you in its glory and its splendor. It is such a complex, amazing design which proclaims your wisdom 
and your power. Simply by the word of your power, you brought it all into existence in six days. And Lord, ever since that moment of creation, you have sustained it to every atom. And it does what you have decided and purposed and willed that it should do. Thank you that you have given, you've made us as the most glorious part of your creation. We are made in your image. We are the most godlike thing in creation. And we have a responsibility to you to worship you, to live for you, to praise and glorify you day by day. Lord God, our Creator, we acknowledge that we have failed. You've told us to love you with all our heart and soul and mind and strength, and to love our neighbour as ourself, but we fail. But we bless you that in your wonderful plan of salvation, you yourself became a man. That the Son of God took on human flesh and lived a little lower than the angels for a little while under the, the rule of your commands. And he kept those commands perfectly. Lord Jesus, we adore you as the Son of God and our Saviour, our Redeemer, the one who gave himself for us, who suffered under the wrath and anger of your own Father who bore the punishment for our sin, but rose again victorious on the first day of the week. Lord Jesus, you are now enthroned in heaven. You are the one that is king over all. You reign over this world, and we rejoice that you are good and your love continues forever. Thank you that you have raised your people, your, your nation, Israel, above all things. That you, those who are adopted into your family, those with whom you have made a new covenant, who are the spiritual Israel of God, that you've raised us and seated us in heavenly realms. You have given us so much to enjoy in this world. You have assured us of your love and presence with us continuously. And one day you'll take us to be with you. And we will see you, Lord Jesus, and be like you forever. Lord, we thank you that in this world, where there is trouble and pain and difficulty and sorrow, you are a God who has promised never to leave, never to forsake your people. We commend those we know who are facing difficulties and troubles into your care. We think especially of Sandy. We pray that he would know your presence and love and strength surrounding him and that you would bring healing and restoration. Lord, thank you that you have promised to be with those who trust in you that you'll never leave us lord we pray for our nation in this time of crisis we pray for wisdom for those in positions of power and authority we pray that you would bring them to faith in jesus christ that they might rule by your wisdom rather than by man's wisdom lord thank you that we have the assurance that you're in charge of everything that goes on in this world and it is for the sake of your church to build your kingdom. And even Satan himself and all the powers of hell cannot stop your plan to bring your people out of darkness into the wonderful light of your kingdom. To be with them through this world and one day to bring us to glory. You are a wonderful God and we adore and praise you in Jesus' name. Seeking your forgiveness once more. Amen. Let's read God's word together now in Genesis chapter 3, first of all. First book of the Bible, Genesis chapter 3. We're going to look at some verses there and then go to the other end of the Bible. To Revelation. Genesis 3, and we'll read there from verse 8. The earlier part of the chapter records how Satan had tempted Eve, and Eve had disobeyed God and taken the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and then given some to her husband. Verse 8 then. Then the man and his wife 
heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? Not that God didn't know where man was, but he was um, calling him to, to be with him. He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree from which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all the livestock and all the wild animals. You will crawl on your belly, and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. To the woman he said, I will greatly increase your pains in childbearing. With pain you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. To Adam he said, Because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food, until you return to the ground, since from it you are taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. Adam named his wife Eve, because she would become the mother of all the living. Now let's go to the book of Revelation right to the other end of God's word Revelation chapter 21 Revelation 21 and let's read from verse 1 there The Apostle John here recording the vision that God had given while he was in exile on the island of Patmos. Then I saw a new heaven, that is a new sky, and a new earth. For the first sky and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega. That's the first and the last letters of the Greek alphabet. The beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty I will give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. He who overcomes will inherit all this, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. And then if you go on to verse 1 of chapter 22... Chapter 22, in the first verse there. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal, 
flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. The angel said to me, These words are trustworthy and true. The Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, sent his angel to show his servants the things that must soon take place. Amen. May God richly bless his words, which, as we've read, are trustworthy and true. May it be for his praise and glory and for our own blessing. Let's praise God together by singing Psalm 93 and sing psalms. The Lord is king, his throne endures, majestic in his height. The Lord is robed in majesty and clothed with strength and might. Before we turn to God's word, let's join in prayer together once more. Lord God, we acknowledge you to be the God who speaks to us as we read this wonderful book. We recognize the Bible to be the most precious thing in the world because it is your word that's going to stand forever. And it is an expression, a revelation of who you are what you have done and what you expect from us as your servants. We are dependent on your Holy Spirit who carried men along as they wrote these words. We are dependent on him to give us the understanding and insight that we need. Lord, help us to understand these things. Help me to explain it in a way that is true and faithful and that will bring you the glory and honour you deserve. And may it be a source of blessing and encouragement to each of us. May it strengthen our faith in you, the living God, and enable us to apply these things to our daily lives, that it may be evident that we are your people, that we have a passion and a love for your truth, and that we live according to your word. Lord, there's, there are things in our lives that need to change, things that... that <laughs> are wrong that we need to turn from, to repent of. Attitudes and thoughts and words and actions that are wrong. Please enlighten us. Show us your truth and your ways and enable us to walk in your paths for your glory. Bless us richly then for the glory of Jesus our Saviour. 
in whose name we worship and adore you. Amen. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 1. We haven't read these words, but I just want to read right at the very end of chapter 1, where we have a record of how God has created the world in six days. Verse 31, God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. That's how the Bible begins, with this wonderful description of the creation of the universe by God's power, by God's work. And when it is all complete, this is God's assessment of it. He saw all that he had made, and it was very good. But friends, as we look at our world, or the world we live in now, as we see all these things, we cannot say it is all very good. I remember, <clears throat> remember doing an assembly with the young, youngsters in Wharton Primary School, and we'd spoken about creation, and I asked them, is the world very good? And even these youngsters were able to say, no, there are things that are not good. As we look at the present circumstances we're in, the coronavirus and the sickness and the death that it brings and the sadness and the, the misery to so many, tens of thousands of people, we cannot say that is very good. We heard on the news just recently, the end of last week, of people being murdered in Inverness at a lockdown party it seems watching the television a number of adverts that are, I've seen recently of charities asking for money to help provide clean water for those in Africa people who do not have access to clean water and as a consequence facing all kinds of disease. That's not very good. That is not the world that God first created. So the question arises, how then did we get to this state? How did we get to this state where the world is not very good anymore? Something catastrophic has happened from its first creation. Well, God has given us insight into what has happened. We read in Genesis chapter 3 there, this is verse 17. God says to Adam, Because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you'll eat of it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since you were taken from it. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. Here, God is telling us what went wrong. It was a perfect world. Adam and Eve, the first man and woman, were perfect people. And friends, this is history. This is not myth. This is not legend. This is history. This is what God has revealed of the beginning of time. Adam and Eve were perfect people living in a perfect environment. Everything was very good. God is a perfect God. He couldn't create anything except perfection. And in that perfection, 
Eve, first of all, and Adam as well, rebelled against God. God had given them one rule to test their love for him and their willingness to obey him. And said, you're going to enjoy everything that I've given you in this wonderful garden. But don't eat of this tree. Nothing magical about the tree. It was simply a test of their love for their creator. And they rebelled. And God had to bring a curse on the world. As a consequence of their rebellion, God says, Cursed is the ground because of you. And you will return to the ground. This curse meant that there were, was going to be difficulty and trouble and pain. Sickness, illness, viruses, trouble, hard work, and finally, death. That was what God had warned. That's what God had said to Adam and Eve. The day that you eat of this fruit, you will die. The process of death will begin. A relationship will be broken. It will die when you rebel against me. Adam had never experienced pain before this. Eve had never experienced pain. But God had injustice to curse this world. So not only Adam and Eve were affected by these things, but the whole of creation was affected. The whole of creation was affected by what Adam had done. All the trouble and pain that we experience is a consequence of what Adam has done. We've been enjoying the sunshine the last few, two or three days. How many people, I wonder, have suffered the pain of sunburn? Something trivial, perhaps, you may feel, but it's a consequence of man's sin. I had a job to do on our own car, and in doing so, I bashed my hands on occasions, cut myself, experienced pain. Trivial little things all the way up to the coronavirus and the misery that's brought and the death that so many have succumbed to. We live in a broken world, a world where there is pain and trouble and suffering and difficulties and heartbreak and loss and mourning and crying. That's not the world that God created but as a consequence of man's rebellion against his God. It was justice. God is a God of infinite justice. He couldn't simply say, well, it doesn't matter very much that you rebelled against me. He had to curse this world. Adam had been warned. God, in his goodness, had given, him, given that warning. But Adam and Eve had chosen to ignore that warning, to believe the lie of Satan and to rebel against God and to do the one thing that God had forbidden them to do. Friends, he is a righteous God and therefore he had to bring a penalty. We all have that sense of justice. It's part of being made in the image of God. If there is wrong, then it needs to be punished. There needs to be a fitting penalty for, for a crime. But friends, there's more to it than just justice. Actually, God's curse on the world is part of his love for mankind. Because the troubles and the pain and the sorrow we face is a warning bell from God saying, there's something wrong with this world. 
It's a consequence of your sin. And if you turn, don't turn from your sin, there's going to be everlasting judgment. Friends, can you imagine a world which is perfect? It's still perfect. Except people do wrong. But nobody ever gets hurt. There are never any tears. There's never any trouble. Everything goes wonderfully smoothly for the whole of life. And then death comes. And people face the eternal judgment of God on sin. People would not be aware. They wouldn't think about the everlasting consequences of their sin. They wouldn't have a sense of the trouble that sin brings. But God, in his mercy, cursed the world. I think it was C.S. Lewis, it was C.S. Lewis, who said something like, God whispers to us in our pleasures. He speaks to us in our consciences, but he shouts at us in our troubles. It is, pain is a megaphone to raise a deaf world. Trouble and pain and sorrow, it's God's way of awakening us to the consequences of sin. Now we may say, but it's not fair. It was Adam that sinned. Not me. I'm just suffering the consequences of what Adam has done. God created this world. He has the right to do with this world as he pleases. And he has chosen to make Adam our representative, our head. If Adam had lived a life of perfect obedience, then the rest of humanity would have continued to live a life of perfect obedience. But he didn't. And this is the way God, in his justice, deals with humanity. As he deals with their head, so those who come after him experience the same consequences. Which is, as we'll see, a wonderful mercy of God that he acts that way. Because there is a second Adam. The Lord Jesus himself comes and as he obeys God, those who are united to him by faith, God treats them the way that he's treated Jesus in his obedience. Friends, but at the same time, we may look at Adam and say, well, he did that wrong. It's not fair that the consequences come to me. But we have to examine our own lives, don't we? We live rebellious lives. We do not do everything that God requires of us. We do those things that God has forbidden. We are responsible for the mess of this world. Yeah, God has cursed it. But we continue in that rebellion that Adam began. <coughs> Second question, though. How can we get out of this state? That's the state the world is in. It's not very good anymore. Yeah, there's lots of wonderful things that God has created and given to us. But there's lots of trouble and pain and sickness and sadness. So, how can we get out of this state? Well, we're moving now into the next phase of this lockdown where the restrictions are being eased. This is the government's exit strategy. There are differences between the Westminster government's, government's plans and the Scottish government's plans. 
And the hope is to restore life as it once was. And the hope is that it'll work. There's no guarantee that it's going to work. Last night, just locally, I was hearing folk having a party in a garden nearby until all hours. I can't imagine that they were keeping their six feet apart. I may be wrong. But if people do not obey the restrictions that the government has put on them, who knows what the consequences will be. We have these extra exit strategies, we have these various phased return to life as it was, but who knows if it's going to work? Who knows if there's not going to be a resurgence in the cases of the virus infection? Friends, God has an exit strategy. God has a way of getting us out of this state, this sin spoiled state and there is an absolute guarantee that his strategy will work what he has planned is going to be fulfilled that is true of all of the plans of God nothing that God has ever planned fails he will fulfill his exit strategy he will get us out of this mess if we're following Jesus Christ. And that exit strategy is actually hinted at in Genesis chapter 3, where God speaks to the serpent and says, Cursed are you above all livestock. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Here is God saying to Satan, to the serpent, someone is going to come who is the seed of the woman, a descendant of Adam and Eve, a human being who is going to crush your head. You will strike his heel, but he's going to crush your head. He's going to trample you underfoot. You're going to be destroyed. He will suffer pain, but he will be triumphant. All the mess, all the trouble, all the misery that you have brought by your deception, by your lies, all of that is going to be destroyed. This descendant of the woman, this human being, is going to set it all right again. He's going to destroy you, although he himself will suffer in the process. Friends, there is only one way out of this mess, this state, this broken world that we're in. And that way is through the seed of the woman. And that is Jesus Christ. He is the second Adam. He's the one who's come to restore this world. To deal with sin and its consequences. And to give us hope of a world where all the consequences of sin have gone. And the curse has been lifted. How can that happen? Well, this is God's plan as we read it in Romans chapter 5. Romans 5 verse 16. Again, the gift of God is not like the result of one man's sin. That is Adam's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if by the trespass of one man death reigned through that one man, 
How much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? This is God's exit strategy. Death came through the trespass, through the sin of one man, Adam. All who are in Adam die. But there's a gift. God simply gives everlasting life, gives justification, that is to be declared righteous. He gives that gift to those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Those who confess with their mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in their heart that God raised him from the dead, they will be saved. They will be justified. They will escape death. God is promising life now as a gift. You don't have to work for it. You don't have to keep lots of commandments. There's nothing you can do to deal with all that rebellion and sin in your life up to this point. You can't deal with that. I can't deal with that. But God deals with it simply by this gift. Believe and be saved. Be justified. You remember we were saying how God deals with the whole of humanity through one representative, through Adam. Well, this exit plan works in the same way. God deals with one man, Jesus Christ, who lived a life of perfect obedience, who never once had a wrong thought, an evil thought, whose attitudes and motives were always perfect, who dealt with people in love, the same love he had for himself. He is the one perfect man. And everyone who believes in him is united to him. And God deals with them as he deals with Jesus. His perfection becomes ours. That's God's justice at work. And so he's promised life now. A freedom now from the consequences of sin. Now it's not a perfect freedom. It's we're still living in a broken world. But when we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, he transforms our lives. We're born again. It's as if life begins again. Our guilt has gone. God has removed that. Guilt is that sense that we've done wrong and we're in trouble. Punishment is coming. That's gone. Because Jesus has suffered in our place. We can live life without a sense of guilt. We're set free from fear. Why should we worry about anything? Jesus said, look at the birds. Do they worry about where they're getting their next meal? No. God looks after them. What about the flowers in the field? Did the flowers worry about where they're getting clothes? No, God clothes them. And he says, you're much more valuable than the birds or the flowers. So why worry? If God is in charge, if God is our Father in the heavens, we are free from worry. God sets us free from fear. Are we afraid of what the future holds? Are we afraid of what people think of us? Are we afraid of what life might bring? The trouble? 
the disease, the sickness? Are we afraid of death itself? Well, by trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are set free from these fears. Over and over and over, God says to us in his word, do not be afraid. If God's in control, if God's in charge of my life, why should I be afraid? If Jesus has suffered and died in my place, I don't need to fear death. Because it's going to take me into glory. To be with the Lord Jesus. The fear of, God, uh, of death is gone. We're set free from a meaningless existence. What's the point of life? If it all came about just by chance, and we are the products of chance, why are we here? What's the point of our existence? God sets us free from that meaninglessness. We are here to serve the living God, to enjoy him forever. There's a purpose in our existence, in our lives. We're here to serve God. To enjoy him. To see him at work in our own lives. And to look forward to what he's got in store for us in a world to come. But friends, there's a problem. Well, not a problem. But while we are saved from death, the moment we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, we've passed from death to life. Yet our bodies still are dying. That was the curse that God, or that was the climax to the curse that God brought on Adam. To dust you will return. You're going to die. So while we may be renewed spiritually, we've been saved, we've been rescued from death. We're going to live forever. Our bodies are dying. God has got a plan for that as well. This is 1 Corinthians 15 at verse 20. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. Here is God's exit strategy to set us free from death. As in Adam all die. Everyone is going to suffer death because Adam sinned and brought death and sin to all mankind. But all in Christ, who has conquered death and risen victorious, they share in that resurrection. So all in Christ will be made alive. This physical body is one day going to be renewed. It's going to be made alive. Here's God's exit strategy in its completion. Oh, well, for individuals, at an individual level. There's more to come, as we'll see. When God created man, man was designed to live forever. Man was designed to live forever. I think that's why when we read the early part of the book of Genesis we see people living for hundreds and hundreds of years and we think are these numbers real yes friends they are because the effects of God's curse weren't immediate they developed they became more and more apparent in the world the world was under God's curse and the effects of that curse became more and more ev evident as, and so man's life lifespan reduced and reduced and reduced to what we're familiar with now 
But man was designed to live forever. So those in Christ are going to be resurrected. We're going to have new bodies. Just as Christ was raised from the dead. That's God's exit strategy. We're saved spirit and body. Physically as well as spiritually. To live forever. But then there's more. If we are going to live forever, those who are in Christ, we read there in Revelation how the unbelieving and the ungodly and the immoral, those who've never repented, they're not going to live forever. They're going to die forever under the judgment of God. But for those who are in Christ, who've believed in him and been forgiven, we are going to live forever. And if we're going to live forever, we need a home forever. And that's what I want to think about last of all here. That final state. What can we expect from that final state? We read there in Revelation chapter 21. I heard, John says, a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. And chapter 22, verse 3, No longer will there be any curse. John, in his vision, he sees a new sky and a new earth. Echoes of Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created the sky and the earth. Now there's to be a new sky and a new earth. The Greek has two different words for new. The word new that is used here is the sense of a new edition. It's not something radically new something that's never existed before, it's a new addition. This is the the perfect environment for human beings. The first world, or this world rather, in its perfect condition, was a perfect environment for human beings. So why should God make it different? You remember this is a vision in Revelation. But there are these hints there are parallels with the garden in Eden. God is creating a new universe where righteousness dwells. And there's no longer any curse. The effects of sin or the judgment that God has brought on sin has gone forever. That's why he's able to say there's no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain, no more death, no more coronavirus, no more violence, no more deceit, no more breakdown in relationships, no more loneliness, no more sadness. No more illness. Everything that we are so familiar with that is a consequence of the curse, gone. There's no longer any curse. And we will be dwelling with God and with the Lord Jesus Christ. God himself will be there amongst us. Jesus Christ, the man who walked this earth, who suffered under the judgment of God, who rose victorious and ascended to the Father's right hand. He will be there, and I'm going to see him. (laughs) What comes to mind is uh, reading the Bible with my late mother just a few minutes before she died, actually. She was... 
appeared to be unconscious, but in the hospital bed. I was reading from Revelation, and it says there, and they will see his face. It's chapter 22 and verse 4. They will see his face. And I still remember thinking, Mom is going to see the face of the Lord Jesus. What a wonderful prospect that she would see her Savior. And friends, that's what we're going to do if we're in Christ. We're going to share this new world where the curse is gone and there's never any danger of evil ever returning because it's been banished, it's been overthrown, it's been destroyed. This is God's wonderful exit strategy. This is what he's got planned for me and for everyone who follows the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's a gift. God says to us, anyone who wants to drink, anyone who wants to enjoy this life, come and get it. It's the freest, most wonderful free gift ever there's ever been friends it's tempting to think well that's a way off in the future but when the apostle Peter is writing to his friends and telling them about this wonderful place where righteousness dwells he says what kind of people ought we to be Okay, if we've got this wonderful plan, a wonderful expectation of a new world, what effects that going to have on our lives? Well, he said, how holy, set apart for God, how godly we should be. Spotless, blameless, at peace with him. It should affect my daily life and your daily life. That if this is what God has prepared for us, this is his the expectation we have, it should affect our lives now. We should want to live for him when he's done so much for us. And then, of course, we've got to share this with others. There is a way out of this crisis. There is a way out of this painful world. It's through Jesus Christ. There is a sure hope of a world to come. We need to tell others of this glorious world. Just to finish, I came across this quote. I was given this quote some time ago, and I think it's just so lovely. An earth which no longer smarts and smokes under the curse of sin. An earth which needs no more to be torn with hooks and irons to make it yield its fruit. An earth where thorns and thistles no longer infest the ground, nor serpents hiss among the flowers, nor savage beasts lay in ambush to devour. An earth whose sod is never cut with graves, whose soil is never moistened with tears or saturated with human blood whose fields are never blasted with unpropitious seasons, whose atmosphere never gives wings to the seeds of plague and death, whose ways are never lined with funeral possessions or blocked up with armed men on their way to war, an earth whose hills ever flow with salvation and whose valleys know only the sweetness of Jehovah's smiles, an earth from end to end and from centre to utmost verge, clothed with the eternal blessedness of paradise restored. God has this wonderful exit strategy. Friends, are you part of that strategy? Do you have this confidence, this hope through Jesus Christ? Let's pray. Lord God, you are a wonderful God of kindness, of goodness, of love, you have made these wonderful plans, amazing plans for humanity. 
this world that's in rebellion against you. You have given us insight into what you plan to do. And we thank you that it comes to us as a free gift when we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, you have done all the work. You have purchased your church, your believing people, by that awful death on the cross under the judgment of God. We look forward to that day when we will see you and will be with you in that new world forever. Come soon, Lord. Amen. Let's finish by singing God's praise from Psalm 73 in the older version of the psalm. Singing there from verse 23. Nevertheless, continually, O Lord, I am with thee. Thou dost me hold by my right hand, and still upholdest me. We'll sing from 23 to the end. Let's close with a benediction. Now may grace, mercy and peace from God the Father, Son and Spirit be with you all today and forever. Amen.